So everyone who knows gaming knows the Fallout franchise. And anyone who knows the Fallout franchise probably knows at least one We're thing about its history. Be it the fact that the Fallout that most people know is not even close to the original two games, or maybe that Brotherhood of Steel is one of the most hated games in the series, or maybe the big thing we're going to be talking about today, which is the general consensus by fans of Fallout 4 is that it could possibly contend with Brotherhood of Steel in being one of the most disappointing Fallout games ever. Whatever your thoughts on Fallout 4 may be, I want to talk about the issues that other people and even myself kind of had with this game. Whether it be story inconsistencies or straight up not fun sequences in gameplay loops. But this intro is droning on long enough, so if you want to hear some hot takes about a beloved game in a lot of people's libraries, sit back and let me get into this longer than usual video. So I'm going to say right off the bat, this video is going to be longer than probably every single other video that I've posted. You see, as I'm scripting this, I've noticed how long this video is in comparison to my other ones, and I, I, I just have a feeling it's going to be real long, but let's just get into it. You know, for the first couple years of Fallout 4's release, I never thought that there was anything wrong with that game. And honestly, I didn't even know that some people outright hated it. Though one day when my brother told me to watch a video of Logic, the rapper, I know that's weird, but he was explaining why he didn't like Fallout 4, and it kind of put me into a rabbit hole of reasons people didn't like the game. Now, his video might have just been nitpicks and personal reasons why he didn't like it, but in watching it, I found a lot more videos and a lot more posts and articles about this. Now, there are multiple reasons behind this that I want to get into in this video, but I will say now that I don't think it had a lot to do with gameplay or mechanic issues, as even I think that playing Fallout 4 is one of the most smoothest Fallout experiences, packed full of story and content, with amazing gunplay, an even better base building system. Really though, the issues that people had in it was that jam-packed story as a lot of things within the Fallout 4 story either just blatantly don't match up with the other events in the Fallout games, or it could just be that Bethesda retconned a lot of events, even though a lot of them are small things and it's easy to overlook them, it's all the small things that make the story feel the same. Along with that, a lot of people have the complaint that the Fallout 4 story in general just does not make a lot of sense, and that can be a big issue when having a lore-stuffed game like this. You want it to make sense. That is the last issue that a lot of people had, myself included, though I didn't really notice it until it was pointed out, so maybe it's like a double-edged sword. It's bad, but worse when you expose yourself to it. All of that aside, let me just get into my first point, which is the fact that the lore in Fallout 4 is borked and unrepairable for a few reasons. So let me get into that. The lore in Fallout 4 is absolutely big borked. What I mean by this is not straight up story changes like caused everything or when the Great War occurred. They seem to keep the main story pretty in line with the rest of the games. But what I mean is the smaller things that I feel like they might think you won't notice it changed. Like caps being the main currency for Honest. And let's go into that first. Now, I want to say thank you to every Reddit post, every Steam community post, news article, YouTube video, such and so, so and such, that I watch to hear people complain about Fallout 4, just so I can sum it all up into a few big points in this little summary. So let's get into caps. Everyone knows caps to be the main currency of the wasteland, right? Well, not really, actually. Caps were never really supposed to be the main currency at all, and though other games use caps, it is a Bethesda consistency issue. Yet, they also do it better than Fallout 4 ever did. So, back in Fallout 2, lore said that caps were only used during the first few years of the apocalypse, and it was actually referred to as farmer money, as the market value of a cap was equal to a bottle of water. And in Fallout 2, the main currency was actually the NCR dollar. Now, following into other games, like Fallout New Vegas, there's caps, sure, but most places have integrated in their own trading currencies, be it NCR money, Legion coins, along with pre-war money being re-implemented into a lot of places, and Fallout 4 takes place a few years after New Vegas. And in Fallout 4, we have Diamond City, the trading hub of the East Coast, yet they only use caps. To think of a place that acts as a city with a mayor, school, shops, even a printing press as other cities and communities before have done in the wasteland, why would they not create their own currency? 
As I said before, they have the printing press. They are in Boston where they could possibly get access to a bank and pre-war currency. They live in a baseball stadium where they could use game tickets. There was multiple other options and it is just seen by many that in a game series that was built heavily focused on the economic aftermath of an apocalypse, it's just lazy to use what was literally declared farmer's money in previous installments. So moving on to my next point, I think we talked about caps enough, let's get into the next lore break. One that's actually kind of big and people already know, and that is the jet lore break. So this is another issue with the story of Fallout 2. In Fallout 2, you may remember meeting an absolute genius of a chemist named Myron. Now, Myron never deceives the player, and being the mad scientist that he is, he has no reason to lie to you when he tells you he in fact created Jet. He tells you that he created it almost 200 years after the Great War using Brahmin fertilizer. He even tells you about the test that he does on the slaves at the time and a lot of lives being taken. Then he even has a reason to the creation. He was ordered to make the drug by the Mordinos in the hopes of seizing Redding. Now if you know the jet lore in Fallout 4, you can find a computer in Sanctuary explaining the creation of jet in a scientific lab pre-war, which just doesn't match up with the other explanation at all. Now you may say that he could have been inspired by a past drug and that drug being pre-war jet, but he actually tells you what he's inspired by already in Fallout 2. If you have a high enough science level, Myron can actually tell the player that he was inspired by pre-war drugs like mushrooms and LSD, which were actually where Jet derives from. So that already is just a blatant story break that they did in Fallout 4, and as I said, these aren't big things, but the small things add up to just be a broken lore behind the story. Since that lore break is pretty known already, I will just move on to the next one. Dumb Super Mutants. So this one was one I didn't really know about, but apparently is a lore break for most of the Bethesda Fallout games in general, but super mutants were never supposed to be the big dummies we have today. In Fallout 4, it is said that Virgil is the only smart super mutant in Boston, and honestly it shows as <laughs> Whoa. And honestly, it shows as every super mutant is an angry ravager cannibal pretty much. But in Fallout 1, there was an actual reason to why the super mutants were aggressive. They were brainwashed by the children of the cathedral to see humanity as the enemy, before the brainwash actually wore off for a lot of them and they integrated themselves back into society. I mean, in Fallout 3, there's a whole city of super mutants that seem like normal people socially. In older games, there were even super mutants signing peace treaties, business deals. They had cities with laws. I mean, they were not the stupid and aggressive super mutants that Boston seems to be full of. On top of that, they shouldn't even be in Boston. So to those who don't know, super mutants are not created by the radiation. They are created by a virus called FEV, or the Forced Evolutionary Virus. But not only FEV. See, in Fallout 1, there was a lab in which one of the greatest minds in the wasteland had to psychically connect himself to a computer and spend years formulating even his first super mutant. Then after a lot of super mutants were created, his lab was destroyed, destroying all knowledge of how super mutants were actually created. In Fallout 2, super mutants were actually endangered at that point and were going extinct. The species pretty much were going dead. So if there were any left on the East Coast, which if there were, there wouldn't be that many, and Fallout Tactics, the Midwest population of super mutants were already wiped out by the Brotherhood of Steel, and in Fallout 3, the Brotherhood of Steel ended up seizing Washington DC, and we all know that the Brotherhood of Steel does not let super mutants slide, so why have so many been able to take up shop in Boston? I mean, there shouldn't even be super mutants in the East Coast in the first place, so how did they get there? But that's enough of that point, and I want to move on to the last and final lore break that I want to talk about today. The Brotherhood of Steel in Fallout 4 is useless. So this is probably going to be the shortest, but it's because it makes the least amount of sense. If you know the Fallout games, then you know the Brotherhood of Steel. And if you know the Brotherhood of Steel, then you know that they are tech maniacs who will do anything for that piece of pre-war tech. I mean, look at the power armor, the pride win. I mean, ironically, they pride themselves on the tech that they actually have. So why the hell would they want to nuke the Institute? I mean, I understand why they hate sense and want to wipe out the population of the Institute, but it feels like with everything that BOS has already done, it is 100% out of their character to not take a chance at the most technologically advanced technical hub in the wasteland. 
Even if they had to go the route of destruction to take the base, seeing how long they waited to repair Liberty Prime, they would have no issue repairing the Institute base after taking everyone out. I mean, sure, this is not really a story or lore break, but when you give us five games that really make a clear motive out of a character or group, it is really weird to see them do the one exact thing that they would never do. But honestly, you can do with that what you will. As I said, this would be the shortest lore break, but honestly, there are so many that I could go into for days, but I want to move on to other reasons that some people might have been disappointed in Fallout 4. I do want to say thank you to Mithra P over on Steam for laying this all out plain and simple. I will throw a link to that discussion in the description below if you wanted to check out more of what they had to say. Moving on to the next reason I have found that might be a reason that people don't really like Fallout 4 and may have found it a more disappointing entry to the series is the fact that the story just does not make a whole lot of sense in general. Not to mention when you compare the story of Fallout 4 to the rest of the games, it honestly doesn't even stand up to the others in the series at all. Not including Fallout 76 though. In the previous games, you are responsible for changing the wasteland, but you can do it in the way that you want. Scripted events were rare and few. It was a true series of choices. I always think about Fallout New Vegas and how you have options left and right. You want to join the Legion and bring your karma all the way down? Becoming a true villain of the wasteland? Finishing the game off with the Legion taking the bridge? You can. Or if you want to go the complete opposite way and want to join the NCR becoming the best person of the wasteland, helping every single person you can, do it. And even if you want to be a complete neutral, you can. And with all of those decisions, the wasteland knows you for them. People won't want to associate with an evil legionnaire, but they would want to associate with someone who helped every person in their town. Now, when you take a look at that intense system, which is even very similar to Fallout 3, I've just played more Fallout New Vegas, that's why I'm commenting on that game, but when you look at that system, then you look at how the main missions and side missions shape the character in Fallout 4, it seems way too dumbed down to even be a sequel. Sure, you can still make decisions, but that whole karma system was totally removed, being replaced with companion affinity, and no matter what decisions you make along the way, the main story still paints you the same general character no matter what path you decided to go on. Now, as I said, I know that you can make decisions that change the outcome of the future story, but instead of putting you in the spot of wanting to get better when you're bad or vice versa, certain decisions will just cancel out the future quests, or joining certain groups will cause you to be shunned by others. I understand where their thoughts were on this, but with a game trying to give you the full freedom, where's the choice to change your mind? It seems once you set down a path of the story, it locks you to it. The biggest probably being the Minuteman. The game makes you feel like helping Preston Garvey is mandatory, some players not even knowing that you can walk right past. Though if you do it, with it being one of the first missions you probably will, you're locked into constantly being asked to help settlers and are officially the savior of the wasteland, even if you do not want to be. Now, onto a few things in the story that are just kind of nonsense, starting with who even ordered the abduction of Sean? Kellogg says it was the old man, which seems as though he's talking about Sean, though Sean was a baby, and if it has anything to do with time travel, then why would older Sean need baby Sean? Would the events not lead up to old Sean if he stayed? And if he has to get kidnapped and Sean knows, then who originally kidnapped him? See, I'm just as confused as I sound. The nonsense I'm spitting out, though, is exactly how the story expects us to understand. Leading on to the next confusing story moment on the topic of Sean, the Institute is the most advanced technological group in the wasteland. They have figured out robotic replacing of people, making plant life from cells, growing and cloning gorillas, curing illnesses, yet Sean dies of cancer. Could they not figure out a cure of cancer or at least a treatment to keep him going? I mean, Kellogg stays the same age for over 60 years. Could they have not found a way to keep the father of the Institute alive? Even if not, why did they not look into other options, like the weird stuff going on at the Cavits? If they are all knowing in the wasteland, they should have known what they were doing, or even replacing himself with a synth. But no, the story takes every route to make the player think that them taking over the Institute was the best option. When in reality, Sean knows nothing about you in the long run, you could destroy everything, and in the end of the day, it is another one of those things that locks you into a story option of taking the Institute or a kind of being banned thing, locking everything to one story path. The next thing I want to touch on is already something I mentioned, but the Brotherhood of Steel's motives are nowhere near what they would be in any other game. They are known for trying to preserve every single bit of tech, especially pre-war, 
and yet their whole mission throughout the game is to destroy the Institute, the hub of tech in the Wasteland, and destroy Synths, the most technologically advanced robot in the Wasteland. They don't even have the idea of taking it over for themselves. They are just hellbent on destruction, and it makes no sense when you look at the other game's versions of the Brotherhood of Steel. I will leave that point there as I already touched on it earlier. On to the last nonsense story plot hole. What exactly do the Institute even want? Like, what are their goals? What are their motives? Sure, the Brotherhood of Steel seem to have reverse motives in this game, but at least they have a goal. It seems like the Institute doesn't even have a reason to be doing what they're doing. They say it's for the betterment of humanity, but you never learn why. Sure, they are trying to cure illnesses and hunger, but they don't let anyone know about it. Along with that, why do they kidnap people other than to run tests? But you don't learn the tests or the reason of the tests. And you have to ask with Sean dying of sickness, is what the Institute doing even working? It just seems like they want you to think that everything the Institute does is so secretive for the reason of not letting the Wasteland know their intentions, but in all honesty, it feels like a sloppy fix to potholes in the large and convoluted story. So I know this was quite a lot. This is probably going to be one of, if not the longest video I've ever done. And I want to sum it down to what I think about everything. I want to make it clear now that this video is not supposed to be why I do not like Fallout 4. In fact, I actually love the game so much. I have countless memories of it and hundreds of hours between my PC and my PS4 but I can't help but notice how many other people don't like it as a Fallout game. Most of my friends actually dislike it. I've seen a lot of things online. My brother, I mean, I hear negativity about this game all the time. Though I also know a couple of friends who love it just as much as I do. And I watch a lot of YouTubers that also only do Fallout 4 content. From the huge world and in my opinion awesome DLC, along with some of the best mods you can get, I will not sit here and say that I think that Fallout 4 is a bad game. Though as I said, I can't look past some of the problems that people have found with the game, especially being a fan of the other games in the series. I just wanted to talk about a few of the issues that caused Fallout 4 to be one of the most disappointing entries in the franchise. Though, that does not mean it was not a fun and good game. And again, I just want to apologize about this video being so long. I really just did not expect it to go on and on and on when I was scripting it out, but I really hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I really hope that I did not totally ruin a great game for you all. And honestly, I'm going to go crazier than I already am if I don't hurry up and finish this video off. So, as always, let me know what you guys have to say about this video, whether or not you absolutely hate my take, or maybe you can see where people are coming from. And if you have any other suggestions, definitely throw those in the comments as well. And really quick, I just want to tell you all about a new thing I'm doing with the channel. I've started a Patreon, you can find the link on the screen in the description and all my channel links. But I started it to open up a little more to the YouTube community while also setting up an option for those who want to support the channel a little bit more. Now I want to say that the views and comments that I get on these videos is plenty. But to those who want a little more behind the scenes, a weekly schedule for all the new videos, music up to a month before it's released, and your name at the end of every single video, go ahead and check out that now. But as I said, totally don't feel pressured at all to visit. If you're here, that is totally enough. And if you like this video, you should totally go check out the rest of the videos on my channel. And don't forget to like and subscribe to stay up to date on all of the new videos coming out. And if you heard any of the music that you liked in this video and you want to hear more, go check out Billy the Whip com or just build the whip on any music platform now and as always to all of you beautiful people who sat here till the very end of this very long video thank you so much and have an absolutely great day getting aggressive on the track i'm never holding back packing stanzas in the sack next to the stacks and nip a cag making me sick is making me yak feel like i'm having a heart attack you feel like you know me you don't know jack i'm a killer the mind's wearing black like the zodiac it's a fact.